Well, today we come to the final passage in 1 Peter. It's been a wonderful journey, being reminded of gospel truths and who we are in the light of those gospel truths. And I've called this final section, We Are Standing Firm. That is what we are called to do as God's people. Uh, We are to stand firm in the midst of suffering, holding on to God's grace on the road to glory. That's what we're going to dig into in this passage today. As always, just take some time to read through the passage for yourself and familiarize yourself with what Peter is saying and take note of repetition and interesting ideas and questions you might have. I'm going to give you some thoughts on on how I understand this passage to be working. Just remembering the context of the end of chapter 4 where Peter said that those who suffer according to God's will should entrust themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This idea of entrusting ourselves to God and continuing along this journey um, of life until we reach glory, Peter in this section gives us a few things that will help us Um, as we entrust ourselves to God, to continue, um, to stand firm. In many ways, I see this verse 12 as uh, the key to this whole section and to the whole book in some ways, because Peter says here, this is the true grace of God. So he's saying, I've written here briefly, And I want you to know this true grace of God. I've written to encourage you to testify that this is the true grace of God. And then he says, stand fast or stand firm in it. And then we also see this call to stand firm in the faith in verse 9. And we're told that God himself will keep us strong, firm and steadfast. So this idea of standing firm or standing fast is a a key theme in this section. It is God's grace that we stand firm in. Um, God shows favor or gives grace to the humble, as we see here in verse 5. So it's this grace that we are to stand firm in. And then Peter gives us throughout this chapter different things that will help us to stand firm in God's grace. And firstly, he addresses elders in the church. He calls elders shepherds, and he links us as elders under the chief shepherd. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, as those, if Peter himself had witnessed Christ's sufferings, Um, And he's been speaking about suffering. Because Christ suffered, those who belong to him will suffer too. And he's saying, we know that suffering is to be expected now, but glory is coming. So he links all of this in with our Lord Jesus, um, the sufferings that he faced. But he is the chief shepherd under which um, elders are to, to do the work that God has entrusted them to do. Christ is the one who has ensured the eternal glory. Uh, He's called us as his children to this eternal glory. And he is the one who will give us peace. Um, He is the one who has secured the grace that is ours because of Jesus. So the focus of these opening verses is on the elders and how the elders help the church, lead the way in helping the church to stand firm It's important to just see that he says, be shepherds of God's flock. The flock under our care as elders in the church is not our flock. It's God's flock that he has put under our care so that we might watch over them. See, a shepherd's role is to feed the flock. And we do that through God's word. And the shepherd's role is to watch over the flock, protecting them from error. And then Peter gives a number of qualifications that will ensure that the shepherd does this well. So the shepherd should watch over the flock willingly as God wants you. So not because you must. So we're not under compulsion, uh, begrudgingly leading, but willingly. And we're not pursuing dishonest gain, but eagerly serving. So willingly and eagerly. 
Sadly, so many shepherds in the church today seem to be in it for the money, pursuing dishonest gain. And Peter is saying that's not what you're in this for. We are to willingly, eagerly lead the church to stand firm in God's grace. In the midst of suffering, because we do see that suffering is a big theme throughout uh, Peter's letter, and it continues to be a theme in this final section. So we are to lead willingly and eagerly in the midst of suffering on the road to glory. Glory is a massive theme uh, in this last chapter specifically. So we are to lead willingly, eagerly in the midst of suffering on the road to glory. And then he says, not lording it over those entrusted entrusted to you but being examples to the flock so willing eager examples not lording it over so this isn't a heavy-handed bullying of the sheep but rather a loving gentle leading of the sheep leading by example and we do this under the chief shepherd our lord jesus who who said himself that he came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so we should be willingly, eagerly leading by example, uh, being willing to give everything so that our sheep would be well watched over and cared for and well fed. And so the thing that motivates us, though, is that we know that Christ has suffered. We know that suffering will be a reality for us in this life. But just as Christ suffered and then entered the glory, we know that that glory will be revealed for all of us. And for us as elders, we lead this way knowing that the crown of glory that will never fade away is coming. So eternity motivates. And the call to those who are under the elder is to submit. Now submit to a leader who is willingly, eagerly leading by example. Submission to a leader like that is going to be easy. And so we need to be praying for those who are leading the church that they would follow this example, the follow the example of the chief shepherd, our Lord Jesus, and then pray that those under their care would would willingly submit to that leadership. Uh, Peter then moves on and speaks about a different characteristic. He speaks about humility in the next few verses. And he says that humility is key um, if we hope to continue along this road to glory in the midst of suffering still standing firm in God's grace so he says all of you clothe yourselves in humility there's been a big um, together aspect um, of our, our Christian walk submit yourselves it's a plural all of you clothe yourselves with humility Humble yourselves. The, the, he speaks later on here of the family of believers. And greeting one another with a kiss of love. Maybe a very quick note on that in these COVID days. Um, might not be very COVID safe to give a kiss of love. But the idea behind this is just to be lovingly greeting one another. So in these days it might be... a uh, an elbow bump of love uh, or once COVID's gone a hug or a handshake um, but the idea there is just we love one another as family so greet one another so in all of this together aspect of our life as Christians um, Peter is saying a key to our life together is humility we won't love each other well or serve each other well or help each other to stand firm in God's grace well if we aren't humble towards one another. And actually, pride is deadly. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's what we desperately need. We need to humble ourselves under God, under his mighty hand, resting in God's grace, grace that has saved us as terrible sinners. And it takes humility to admit that we are sinners. Um, to ask God to take away our pride so that we might rest in his grace, knowing that he will lift us up in due time. And then this is actually linked, verse 6 and 7. It could read, Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time as you cast, or casting your anxieties on him. So a part of our humility is 
admitting that we, we can't do this on our own. So we cast our anxiety onto him. You see, actually worrying without casting our anxiety, keeping that worry to ourselves is actually a sign of pride. And so pr proud people worry. Where humble people cast their anxieties, cast their worries onto God, knowing that he cares for you. What an incredible thing. The great God of all creation cares for you. So cast your anxiety on, on him. Rest in him. And then the next few verses um, give us a call. Not only do we have, has God given us leaders to help us and he's given us a humble community to help us, but actually there's a call here to be vigilant um, in, our, in our stand in God's grace. We can't get complacent. So these are imperatives. Be alert. Uh, be of sober mind. Uh, they're actually imperatives throughout um, this section that are, they are verbs that are commands. Um, to the shepherds, it's a command to be shepherds. Um, but these imperatives here are, are for us together as a community to help each other, to be alert and of sober mind. Um, we need each other because it's easy as our, by ourselves to get distracted and to start to drift. And that is exactly what our enemy, the devil, wants. He's looking for someone to devour. Now, there's a truth that's worth resting in, in the light of this. Back in chapter 1, verse 5, we were told that we are being guarded by God's power. And God is powerful. He will keep us. And that is a, a great thing to rest in. But the warning here is that we need to trust God's power and trust God's goodness by giving us elders and giving us a community who will help us to stand firm, to be alert and sober-minded. So the devil is looking. He's prowling around looking for someone to devour. We need to trust God that in the graces that he's given us, that he will help us to stand. And then here's another imperative, resist the devil. Standing firm in the faith. And we again need each other to help each other to stand firm. And actually as we look at the family of believers throughout the world and see the kinds of sufferings that they are suffering, it reminds us that it is possible to stand firm. As we see their sufferings, they motivate us to, to keep going. The family of believers encourage one another to keep going. And Peter gives us great words to encourage each other with in the final verses. In verse 10 here, where he says, And the God of all grace, it's this grace in which we stand, who called you to his eternal glory. That's where we headed, to this crown of glory that will never fade away. After you have suffered a little while, so expect the suffering, but also keep it in perspective. After you have suffered a little while, now, you may be facing great suffering, or the people you're teaching may be facing great suffering that doesn't feel like a little while. But in the light of eternity, it is. And so while we suffer in this life, we need to rest in the fact that God himself will restore us and make us strong, firm, and steadfast, and he is powerful to do that. So... We rest in his power. He is the one who will ultimately keep us standing firm in God's grace till the end. He gives us elders who help us to do that. He gives us a, a humble community, a vigilant community of believers around us who will help us. But it's ultimately his strength that will get us to the end. So we can rest. We can know God's peace and rest in that peace. The peace that is ours in Christ. So Peter started in chapter 1 verse 3 by speaking of God's grace and peace. He says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. And he ends where he began by reminding us of God's true grace and we are to stand firm in it and God's peace that we are to rest in. 
A couple of little notes just on this, what may appear a strange greeting at the end. Um, she who is in Babylon, who is this? Um, well, Babylon is symbolic for, uh, for a, a culture um, that is setting itself up in opposition to God. And in Peter's day, uh, Babylon was used by Christians to represent Rome. And when he says she who is in Rome, this is language that's used um, of the church. Um, the church who is in Rome um, sends greetings. So um, Peter is probably writing from Rome at this point. It says she who is in Babylon, so the church in Rome. Um, another place you can go and cross-reference for this type of writing is in 2 John. Um, just verses 1 and verse 13 you see they also use this type of cryptic language in some ways because they were uh, a people under opposition they were facing suffering so Peter is saying the church in Rome um, sends greetings and so does Mark um, this is probably John Mark who, who wrote the gospel of Mark who was a dear friend of Peter much of the information in the Gospel of Mark probably came to Mark from Peter. So Mark's Gospel is in many ways Peter's Gospel. Um, and they send these greetings. And they are a part of the group. The church in Rome are a part of this family of believers who are facing various kinds of sufferings, but who are standing firm in God's grace on this road to glory. And they are also greeting um, this dispersed church that Peter is writing to and he ends with these great words peace to all of you who are in Christ you see we can stand firm we can stand knowing God's peace because we have been given God's grace in our Lord Jesus Christ and we as God's church need to pray that God will keep raising up good shepherds we need to pray that God would keep us humble as we together help each other along this road, we need to pray that we would be vigilant, that we wouldn't get distracted and drift away. We need to pray that we will stand firm in God's grace till the end. Well, as you dig in further, pray that you would rejoice in the truth of this passage and that it would be a delight to teach it to others and lead them to live standing firm in God's grace in the midst of suffering on the road to glory. Well, God bless.